Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the first symposium of the Spatial Cognition Conference. Uh, we have a very exciting uh, lineup of uh, two talks about uh, the effects of exploration on uh, the formation of cognitive maps. And about the format, uh, we will have each talk will be for 30 minutes, and then we'll have 10 minutes for questions. Um, you can either write your questions during the talk in the chat box or uh, ask them later uh, by raising your hand virtually uh, with the reaction button. And first, uh, let's hear from Dr. Eva Brunek from Temple University and the University of Pennsylvania on her work on exploration and cognitive maps. Great. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Okay, great. Yep. Um, so I'll go ahead and uh, share my screen. Uh, so thank you for the introduction, Michael, and uh, thank you to the organizers for putting together this uh, great conference. Um, I really enjoyed the keynote and I'm really looking forward to all the upcoming talks and posters. So um, yeah, as the title of my uh, talk suggests, I'll be uh, telling you a bit about um, some behavioral work I've done um, over the course of my postdoc with uh, Nora Newcomb and Russell Epstein, uh, where we looked at how people explore new environments and how the structure of, those, of that environment might in turn shape the way uh, people approach exploring. So um, something that I probably don't need to emphasize too much to uh, this particular audience is that there is an inherent structure in our environment. So there's um, some uh, intuition that we all share about the structure of the environments that we navigate in. Um, and um, that's sort of reflected in um, the way that we find some environments in uh, uh, more simple or more complex to navigate. So some cities are very uh, complicated and difficult to find your way around, and some cities are very easy to, to find your way uh, around even if you get lost. So I want to illustrate this with a few examples from my personal life um, to hopefully illustrate the point I'm trying to make. So I grew up in the city of Ljubljana, Slovenia. Um, this is the map of the city proper. Um, and it has this very typical structure that many European cities share, which is this um, medieval uh, core uh, center of the city. And then the city kind of grew um, around its perimeter as it grew um, and expanded organically. But the thing that I wanna highlight is that there is no particular alignment to um, cardinal directions and there's no particular axes that streets tend to run along. So so for uh, tourists, these cities can be very complicated to navigate, and you have to rely a lot more on, uh, on visual landmarks to be able to find your way around, and knowing which direction, for example, uh, north you're facing isn't necessarily useful. Um, so after that, I moved to London, which obviously is famous for being very complex, um, and that's also illustrated in the very famous, of course, studies of taxi drivers, where they have to learn this very complex network of 27,000 or so streets. Um, and um, I moved there in the time before we had um, smartphones or before I had a smartphone. Uh, so I did in fact navigate around with a paper map and it was very complicated sometimes to align the paper map to what I was seeing in front of me. Um, but again, the point I'm trying to illustrate is that this is again, a very complex network and there's no particular orientation um, of uh, the street network to a particular axis. So it's very difficult to uh, find your way uh, back once you get lost. And then after that, I moved to Toronto and then eventually to Philadelphia, where I am uh, located currently. Um, and the difference between the two cities I was just talking about and uh, the two that you can see on the screen uh, currently um, is, of course, that uh, North American cities tend to have a much more grid-like organization and tend to be aligned much more neatly to the north, south, and east-west axes. Uh, so for example, if you get lost, um, you can just take another turn and come right back to where you started, um, which of course um, might be sort of trivial. Um, and we all have this sort of intuition that that's how uh, you find your way around. Um, but it's, um, it's an interesting, I think, example to sort of highlight um, the difference in uh, how the difference in the structure of the environment that we navigate uh, might shape the way we approach uh, exploring it in the first place. So um, the work I'll be talking about today is all going to be behavioral, but it's driven by this notion that uh, the hippocampus and entorhinal cortex support cognitive maps uh, while we explore. And the interesting thing is that uh, these um, neural structures, among others, um, seem to be particularly strongly driven by exploration. Um, so I'm not going to go into too much detail on the experimental um, 
details of each of these uh, papers, but um, there's a lot of work now suggesting that, for example, even as rodents just uh, pause, even when navigating very simple maps and look around, so turning their heads to scan visually, um, that uh, results in a stronger um, expression of place fields in the hippocampus. Similarly, even after um, the environment is already known, so in, again, a very simple environment such as a tea maze, um, when the uh, rats are at particular decision points in the maze, um, their hippocampal patterns still seem to be sort of exploring and sampling alternatives in the environment. Uh, so even after you already know the structure of the environment, there's still something that's going on that seems to be uh, driven by exploration particularly strongly. Now switching gears a little and moving into uh, the primate world, um, it doesn't seem to be driven by locomotion, uh, this relationship between exploration and uh, this sort of stronger neural response. Um, so when uh, primates sim simply visually explore a static image, so shown um, in these um, traces on the image here, um, that also uh, produces uh, grid-like responses in their enterinal cortex. Um, so again, there's something about sampling and exploring the world around you, even if it's just visually, um, that seems to drive this, um, the creation of um, maps. And then uh, full circle back to humans, um, even as humans uh, visually explore images, um, the more exploration that we do with our eyes, so the more fixations um, that uh, humans make, the stronger the response um, in the hippocampus. So again, these are very different uh, sort of fields and very different methodologies, um, but all of them to me suggest that there's something about exploring that's very important to creating uh, useful knowledge structures such as cognitive maps. And so um, here's a quote that I really like from, uh, from, from this, uh, these two books uh, by an Australian Aborigine about how exploration patterns uh, might build new maps of new environments. Um, so they say, I don't go far in the beginning, I go some distance and come back again, then in another direction and come back and then again in another direction. Gradually I know how everything is and then I can go far without losing my way. So this is a really concise and I think uh, very interesting description of how you might explore a new environment to, to get a sense of um, your bearings in this environment. Um, but we know from empirical work, um, primarily led by Steve Weisberg and uh, Nora uh, Newcomb, that um, not everyone creates a success, uh, successfully creates a map. So no, not everyone is able to integrate all this information into a map. Um, so um, in a series of studies um, they have now shown using uh, the environment of virtual Sultan, which I'll also be talking about today, that even though the uh, all people, all the participants have the same experience, sort of how they're taught um, and guided around this environment. Um, they um, form very different mental representations of this environment. Um, so what happens in the um, in, in this paradigm is the participants are guided along these two routes shown in red, um, and each of these routes has four buildings um, along uh, along the way. Um, and then they're also shown these two connecting routes in blue, um, which are uh, sort of meant to help it scaffold their representations um, and connect across these paths. Um, and then they're asked to point between these pairs of buildings. Um, and uh, so this is the same sort of judgment of relative direction task that we just uh, heard about. Um, so the lower your error in terms of the pointing performance, the, the more accurate your mental map is um, considered to be. And so um, what they find is that there's quite a bit of variability between people on how they solve this task. So some people shown here in green um, perform really well, regardless of whether the buildings that they're pointing between are on different routes or they're part of the same trajectory, uh, whereas some people um, basically form no map whatsoever and they um, seem to be very inaccurate regardless of the locations that they're pointing between. So, we thought, okay, so there might be something that's going on that is um, reflected in these very fine grained moment to moment um, behavioral fluctuations that seems to shape how people actually, uh, whether people are actually able to solve this problem of pointing between locations in the environment. And to, um, to look at this, we thought we would um, turn to free exploration as opposed to guiding participants in a particular structured way. 
So um, we, um, in collaboration uh, with Jennifer Sutton at the University of Western Ontario, um, uh, took data from 84 participants who um, navigated in the uh, virtual Silkton environment. They were given 16 minutes to explore this environment that was previously unfamiliar to them. Um, and they all started in the same location. So I'm again showing the same uh, map and they all started in, in the same location. So then what we can look at is how people's trajectories differ between, uh, between them. So um, again, first, I think it's helpful to just sort of visualize what people are even actually doing. Um, and I'll show you examples from two participants. Uh, so this is one of them. Um, their current location will be indicated with this blue dot and their trajectory will be shown in red. Um, and I'll just highlight that um, I'm going to show you the same exact amount of data from two different participants. Um, so um, it's a little sped up, but it's the same uh, amount of time that they were given to explore. So as you can see, this participant um, isn't sort of stationary. They are moving, uh, but they pause every once in a while. Um, they tend to sort of retrace their steps here. So they're going back um, along the trajectory they've just covered, that they change their mind again, uh, walk up to the decision point, then pause again, and then eventually make the decision. So there's um, they are moving fairly consistently, but they are pausing um, a bit and uh, they sort of seem less confident in where they're going in this environment. And then in contrast, this is going to now be a different participant. So they're not in the same location as the participant I just showed you, but it will be the same amount of uh, time. And so um, what you can see here is that uh, despite the fact that this was also a new environment for this participant, um, they seem a lot more confident as they're exploring. They're sort of continuously moving. Um, and um, it seems like almost like as if they've made up their mind about where they're going at each decision point before they even reach it. So they don't seem to pause at decision points very much. So how do you put a number on this? There's obviously something quite different between the ways in which these two participants explored, um, but it's hard to quantify it, um, or at least um, there's many different ways you could quantify that. So um, here's all the participants' trajectories. And as you can see, there's some sort of squiggles, uh, meaning that participants did sort of go completely off the path. Sometimes um, they explored between the buildings and they were allowed to do that. Um, they could go wherever they wanted, um, but it's hard to um, even describe this uh, fairly complex environment in a concise way. So to try to get a bit of a handle on this, uh, we decided to, uh, to look to space syntax um, to describe this uh, structure of the environment. Um, so uh, I, uh, although some of you will be familiar with space syntax, um, I'll just provide a very quick primer of the, just the technique, uh, the particular measure that we'll be using that uh, results from this technique. So um, space syntax is a graph theoretic approach that um, stems originally from uh, architecture um, and describes each segment in the environment in terms of its, in this case, connectivity to every other segment in the environment. So in this really nice paper led by Amir Javadi, um, they characterize the um, neighborhood of Soho and, and London in the UK um, by uh, a few different measures. Um, but the one that I'll be focusing on is um, axial integration, which is fairly similar to the measure they used of closeness centrality. Um, the, some, uh, the important thing to note is that um, segments with um, high um, integration in this case um, are um, relatively more strongly connected to every other segment in the network. So for example, um, the segments on the periphery are going to have low integration because they would be traversed fairly rarely when getting between any other two segments, whereas those in the more uh, center of the environment would have higher integration because they would be traversed more frequently when moving between any two places in the environment. And um, Javadi and colleagues have even found that the hippocampus um, tracks changes in uh, closeness centrality in this case, um, again, indicating that um, even at the neural level, the structure of the environment is reflected in some way and tracked in some way. But so the very uh, a uh, helpful thing and very nice thing is that we were able to use data that already existed on space syntax in this environment that we were using, which is um, virtual Silkton. Um, and again, uh, so this is uh, data provided by Pakratidu et al, who ran some very interesting analyses on how um, the structure of the environment relates to pointing performance. Um, but so what um, 
what you can see is sort of the central, the, the streets that are, that are more in the center of the environment have um, higher uh, integration values indicated by warmer colors, whereas those that are on the periphery of the environment uh, tend to have lower integration values indicated by uh, cooler colors. So um, how can we relate this measure of um, axial integration, um, again, shown here in a slightly different color scheme, to what people actually do? So what we thought we could do is um, if we take an example participant's trajectory, so this would be a first person perspective, obviously they wouldn't see any sort of a trajectory, this is just an illustration of what uh, the path that they might have taken, what we can do is for each coordinate that participants cover in space, take the corresponding axial integration value. So if we express this as a sort of time course, um, what we can do is express um, for each coordinate the participants cover in space, the corresponding axial integration value, and then simply calculate the mean of those values. So a higher experienced integration value would mean the participants tend to spend more, relatively more time in highly integrated parts of the environment, whereas a lower um, experienced integration value would mean they tend to spend more time on the periphery of the environment. So again, just a, an example participant. So this is their actual trajectory that they took through the environment. What we can then do is only for the parts that they, that they spent on the paths um, themselves, we can extract the corresponding um, spatial um, space syntax values, uh, so integration values. Um, and I will note that we also took uh, note of the amount of time that they spent off path, um, but we didn't find uh, that to be um, related to anything or to be predictive of anything. So um, I'm not gonna spend any time on that, but um, this was accounted for in our analyses. Uh, so the amount of time that they spent off the paths. And so again, if we take all of these trajectories that I was showing you just before, and we now color code them according to their space syntax values, uh, we can then uh, use this value, so the experienced integration value per participant and relate it to their actual spatial memory. So um, what we find is that there's quite a bit of uh, variability in, in how um, how in participants experience integration. So some people really do tend to um, spend more time in high and some in low integration areas. And so um, obviously the key question is, does this relate to the spatial memories that participants form? Uh, so to measure this, we have two um, spatial memory measures. Um, one is this on-site pointing task that um, we um, that where participants are placed at each of the buildings um, in the environment and then are asked to point to every other building and then their um, average error is calculated. And the other measure um, is uh, the accuracy of the maps they draw. So to, to measure accuracy, um, Melissa Nantes um, calculated the Gardoni score coefficient for each participant's uh, drawn map at the end of the exploration period, uh, where zero would indicate no correspondence between the true, uh, the ground truth and the map that they drew, uh, and one would indicate perfect correspondence between the two. Um, and so um, what I'm gonna show you now is the participants experienced integration on the x-axis and their absolute pointing error on the y-axis. So again, here, lower would be better. Um, and what we find is a significant relationship between the two. So the higher the experienced integration um, of the participants' trajectories, the um, lower their absolute pointing error was, suggesting that the uh, where participants tended to spend their time was either beneficial or potentially detrimental to their spatial memory. Um, and a similar trend, slightly weaker one, um, is also emerged with these Gardoni map scores. So here, higher is better. So um, participants who uh, scored, who had higher experience integration tended to have more accurate uh, maps that they drew. But another way you could think about this is um, if we think back to those videos I showed you, um, is that participants don't just sort of continuously move through the environment. Some participants tend to pause a lot more. Some participants seem very confident and um, just continue navigating. So another way we can, um, another measure we can look at is the measure of sort of displacement over time. So what I'm showing you here on the x-axis is time for one particular uh, participant. Um, and for each time point, so every 100 milliseconds, the amount of distance that they covered in that time. So you can see that there's quite a bit of variability. They're definitely not constantly moving. Um, and then there's periods where they're basically paused completely or they move very little. So there's something um, 
so th th that potentially seems like something that we should look at as well, um, and we should put a number on it. So here's their whole exploration map, um, again, showing that um, different people had very different approaches. So this is another participant showing you here. Um, and so this measure of um, mean squared displacement over time has also previously been shown by Gagnon and colleagues to be related to um, the uh, uh, accuracy of the spatial maps that are formed later. Um, and so what uh, has previously been shown is that participants who move more, who move further from the start point have higher um, have more accurate maps. But another thing we could look at is whether participants who tend to move more um, consistently, so tend to pause less and seem more confident in their exploration patterns um, uh, or exploration trajectories um, tend to form better maps um, as well. And so that's exactly what we did. We calculated the mean squared displacement uh, for each participant, and then again, related it to absolute pointing error and the uh, Gordoni map scores. So here again, we find a significant relationship in the same direction. So participants who seem more confident, so who paused less um, and seem to um, move more um, consistently perform better on the pointing task. Um, but interestingly, this relationship didn't reach significance with the Gardoni map scores. So suggesting that um, there's some potential uh, for dissociating these uh, relationships uh, with different measures. And so what you might be thinking is, OK, so that's that's all fine and good. But um, it does seem like you would have to um, have quite a bit of coverage of the environment to get a sense of where everything is. Um, so um, we were thinking potentially it's just how much of the map do you cover that predicts how good the map that you uh, that you subsequently form might be. So to look at this, we um, took our third measure, and this is the final measure of exploration that I'll be talking about today, which is um, roaming entropy. Um, and roaming entropy basically describes the degree to which one explores the environment in a given amount of time. Um, it's been used in, um, in, for example, rodent and human studies um, and seems to relate to quite a few interesting things. Um, notably, people who have higher roaming entropy in just their everyday journeys report greater subjective well being. So there's um, something about um, sort of exploring more and uh, seeking out more novelty in everyday lives that uh, seems to be. Um, related to how people actually um, tend to feel in general. But how entropy um, is actually calculated is you divide the um, grid of your map into the number of places or states. Um, and then if a participant tends to mostly explore one or two states, that would be very low entropy. Um, but if they tend to um, explore more of the available states in the environment, so spending less time in each of them, but covering more of them, uh, that would be, uh, that would result in higher entropy. So here's the sort of uh, map of the coverage of all participants in our particular map. So dividing it into a 50 by 50 grid of possible places that one could cover. Um, and again, people differ in roaming entropy quite a bit. So um, despite the fact that there's obviously structure in, in what they do, where they tend to gravitate more towards the center of the environment, um, different participants will show different patterns. So for example, this lower entropy participant um, has slightly warmer colored um, places because they tended to spend more time in each of these places. Uh, but obviously, um, the flip side is that they saw fewer of them, whereas this higher entropy participant uh, tended to grow more and see more of the available places, but obviously spent less time in each individual place. So we thought maybe this could also be predictive of the accuracy of the maps that you form, because there could be a sort of trade off between um, how many places versus um, the um, amount of time that you spend in each of them. Um, so again, um, the roaming entropy measure will be on the x-axis and the pointing error and then the Gradoni scores on the y-axis. But as the uh, slide title uh, gives away, we found no significant relationship to cognitive maps with either of um, these measures, suggesting that it's really not about the coverage, it's about the specific, um, the, the properties of the streets that you explore that seems to really shape um, the accuracy of the mental maps that you're able to form. So then we asked, so this is fairly interesting, um, and it suggests that this might be related to individual differences. So it could be that people who um, explored more in high integration areas have a better um, trait ability to navigate, um, higher trait ability to navigate, and um, might be more able to pick up on the structure of the environment. Or it could be chance where just by 
pure chance, you might have turned in the correct direction when you started exploring, um, and then the environment kind of pulled you in the correct uh, direction. So uh, to address this uh, particular question, uh, we recruited 52 new participants um, who were then given 25 minutes to explore to sort of help them uh, get more detail of the environment. Um, and then they also completed the Santa Barbara Sense of Direction Scale to measure their trait navigational ability. So um, again, this is just sort of the same sort of map that I was showing you um, earlier um, with uh, the overlaid um, uh, axial integration values. And again, we see a fair um, bit of variability in terms of what participants tend to do. Um, so there's no obvious differences between the first and the second experiment in these exploration patterns. We again had the on-site pointing uh, task, um, but we weren't able to get hand-drawn maps because this uh, study was run uh, during the pandemic. So participants completed this drag and drop model building task. Um, and the resulting uh, value is a bidimensional regression coefficient also ranging from zero to one, where zero would again indicate no correspondence between the model that the participants built and the ground truth, and one would indicate perfect correspondence. So um, again, I'll be showing you experience integration on the x-axis, the pointing error on the y-axis. Um, and what we find is, again, uh, the significant relationship between the two, where higher experienced integration was related to uh, lower pointing error or more accurate pointing. Um, but interestingly, in this study, we don't find a relationship between experienced integration and um, the map uh, that participants built. Um, and there's a few possible reasons um, that I can speculate on in the question and answer period. But, um, one of them is that potentially drawing a map um, requires more, um, more detailed and careful consideration of the structure of the environment than just sort of placing uh, the uh, images of the buildings. So um, in terms of the other two measures that I was talking about earlier, uh, we do again find that higher mean squared displacement was predictive of lower pointing error and that uh, roaming entropy had no significant relationship to spatial memory. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to show you those plots, but um, those patterns were all replicated from experiment one. So going back to the question I asked at the start, are these measures related to self-reported trait differences in navigational ability? Um, and um, to give away the answer, they don't seem to be. So the Santa Barbara sense of direction score, uh, where higher scores would indicate more uh, higher performance, um, was not related to experienced integration, to mean squared displacement, or to roaming entropy. So um, this suggests that there's um, something about the self-reported differences in navigational ability that doesn't seem to correspond to these exploration patterns. Um, and again, there's obviously going to be some noise in all of these measures as well as the self-report uh, measures, but it's also um, worth noting that um, participants um, that the self-reported um, questionnaires ask participants primarily about the way they use maps that they already have and not the way they approach exploring um, and building new maps that, of environments that are previously unfamiliar. So um, what this also made us think about is whether this is then completely down to chance. So if it's not related to trait differences in navigational ability, it might just be completely down to chance and it just so happens that the street that you um, turn onto uh, the uh, shapes your um, map of the environment. So to address that possibility, um, we also generated some simulated navigation trajectories uh, where we generated 1,000 sort of um, simulated navigators where they um, which basically created a random walk through the graph of the environment. Um, and at each decision point would randomly choose which direction they would go in, but they didn't backtrack to sort of make it more human-like. So the idea here was to create a, a simulated navigator that would show human-like chance. So you aren't navigating completely randomly because there is structure in the environment, um, but at each decision point, you would completely randomly decide where you're going. So you're not using any sort of strategy. Um, and um, in these trajectories, uh, we were able to match the distance and the travel time to the average human participant. Um, but aside from that, we treated, um, and then that uh, meant that we could treat their trajectories just like human ones. So for each simulated navigator, we would calculate their average experienced integration. And what I'll show you now is the average integration. And then what we can do is compare participants' performance um, to um, 
the, the simulated um, navigators. So what I'll show you here is participant performance uh, split into tercels. So one will be uh, those who perform best on the pointing task um, and the corresponding average integration value for each of those tercels. So the tercels are determined based on their spatial memory, um, but the measure that I'll be showing you is the experienced integration. So what we find here, sorry, I, this was supposed to come up separately, but what, I, what you can see here is again, this relationship that I was showing you before where the highest performing participants have the highest experienced integration. And these 1000 simulated um, data points um, have a significantly lower mean than um, you can sort of see than um, all of our human performers. Um, there's quite a bit of spread also suggesting that it's not something about the, the simulation that just uh, forces um, lower values. Um, but if you then run a t tests, so we ran a thousand uh, t tests comparing each of these ter cells uh, to the simulated data. You can see that in the uh, best performing and the middle ter cell, there's very few uh, t tests that are non significant. So showing here in gray, um, which would indicate that the vast majority of comparisons mean that participants outperform the, the random navigators. Whereas the bottom ter cell, so the uh, worst performing participants, uh, more than a quarter in experiment one um, of these comparisons is non-significant, suggesting that the worst performing participants are much more chance-like than the better performing participants. So they're much more likely to kind of look like just a random walk through the graph and not uh, exhibiting any sort of a strategy. If we then also look at experiment two, looking at the same measures, so the trend is a little bit attenuated as it was in the relationship between the integration and uh, pointing performance, but the message still stands where the bottom, um, the worst performing participants, about a quarter of them, basically look like a random navigator through the graph and don't seem to uh, show any sort of strategy. So with that, that concludes the data part. Um, so um, as I mentioned, we don't find the relationship to self-reported trait navigational ability, um, which is a little bit puzzling to us, but I think it is really important to consider that established measures of navigational ability tend to reflect um, people's reports on how they use their existing spatial knowledge um, and not necessarily how they might approach building or acquiring new spatial knowledge. So how would you build a map if you were placed in a brand new environment, um, which I think is an important distinction and could be part of the reason that we're not seeing this relationship to Santa Barbara in this case, um, although I'm fairly confident that other self-report measures would look similar. Um, and so as a sort of parting thought, um, it's important to obviously consider the different environments which shape um, exploration patterns in different ways. And this is something that we proposed in a recent review that we co-wrote with uh, Michael, as well as uh, Nora and Russell Stein, um, where we um, look, we kind of thought about different types of environments and how they might shape um, the mental representations that people can form. Um, and um, I think there are important considerations such as um, this, the environment of virtual Sultan has more constraints in the navigation and the structure of the affordances really drives people to navigate in particular ways. Um, whereas if you are sort of just placed into an arena or a very open environment and allowed to explore, you would obviously take a very different approach than simply following pre-existing paths. Um, and that feeds into the sort of flip side of this um, uh, uh, sort of problem, which is that different exploration measures may better describe um, exploration patterns in different environments. So it's not necessarily better to, um, uh, to approach every environment in the same way, because um, the structure of different environments will um, determine the way you approach exploring them in the first place. So returning to the beginning, um, and uh, the way that we approach all these uh, different cities, um, I'm sure the next time um, I'm somewhere in a new environment, I'll think a lot more about the um, underlying network of the streets. Um, but it's I think there's a lot of unanswered questions about how um, we explore new environments in the first place, and then also how the structure of the um, environments we're exploring might drive us um, in, in those exploration patterns. So with that, um, I'd like to uh, thank everyone involved in this work, particularly my uh, collaborators and the mentors, um, as well as the uh, funding for this work. And thank you all for your attention. Okay, thanks Ativa uh, for this excellent talk. Uh, we have time for two or three questions. So please 
raise your hands uh, if you want uh, to ask. Yeah, Ruth. Hi, thanks for um, thanks for a great talk. That was really interesting. Uh, I've just got a really simple question. So, particularly in the first experiment, was the starting point randomised? And, and apologies if you said this and I missed it. And um, were people given a time constraint? Because uh, it strikes me that if somebody is initially placed in quite a segregated and peripheral location they may have only just reached the more integrated part of the map before their time expires and therefore um, even if they're navigating in quite uh, an intelligent way um, the very fact that their initial start point puts them in such a segregated location could actually hinder their um, uh, knowledge acquisition. Yeah, thank you very much. That's a really important point. Um, so everyone did start in the same location. It was around here, um, if you can see my cursor. Um, so they they actually started in a fairly highly um, integrated location. So um, you you would sort of um, most of the people did sort of tend to start exploring in in the center of the environment. Um, so um, yeah, per, I completely agree that if you were sort of placed on the periphery, there's very little you can do because you're sort of already out um, out in the field. Um, but um, uh, so everyone did start in the same location and it was a fairly central one. Um, and everyone, there, there was a time constraint. So everyone got uh, 16 minutes in the first experiment and 25 in the second one, but they always started in the same location. So. Um, that is a, an important consideration, though, I agree. That's great. Thanks. And sorry if that was just me missing the point. Thank you. Oh, no, it's that. Yeah, thank you. We have another question from Sarah. Uh, Sarah, can you unmute? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, super interesting. <laughs> great suspense. I was waiting for that, you know, individual different spatial ability at the end. It's like, great, excellent. Um, I have just a question about the, the measures. Um, I'm wondering about this. You mentioned exploration. And when I think exploration, you know, I think like space curiosity, you know, where humankind has never been kind of, if the, the measures that you use may be adapted um, to other measures that relate to, to individual differences or traits that relate to specifically curiosity. Um, and I'm thinking about the study, I think it, it was uh, Frankenstein at all, where they, you know, the, the, the people were navigating and they're like, would you go down that hallway? And the hallway was, you know, blocked with furniture or not. So sort of this idea of surprise, uh, curiosity, if there may be other measures rather than the graph theoretic ones um, related to the network. Just a couple of th uh, thoughts, what do you think about that? Yeah, no, thank you. That's a really interesting um, point. I was just making a note of the study you mentioned because I'm, I'm, I wasn't aware of it um, before, um, but it's absolutely uh, an interesting direction to, to think in and to, um, to consider. Um, it's something I've sort of thought about briefly. We haven't um, sort of looked at anything like that, but I definitely think that there are sort of um, different phenotypes and how people approach um, this sort of task of like exploring a brand new environment. Um, and I think it's also um, I, one thing that I'm wondering about is whether um, absolutely the way you explore a new spatial environment might also be related to the way you would explore learning any type of information. Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot of um, interesting relationships to curiosity to explore. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. So I think uh, time is up for questions. Uh, if you have any further questions for Eva, please direct it uh, to her on the chat or email. Um, and now we move on to Kate Lawson from UC Irvine. Uh, thank you, Kate, for uh, coming at such an early hour uh, to talk. And uh, that's uh, it. Okay, awesome. Can everybody hear me okay? Great, okay. So I'm gonna share my screen. Um, so hi everybody, good morning to those of you in the US um, and good afternoon, I guess, to everybody else. Um, so my name is Kate Lawson. I am a PhD student at the University of California, Irvine. 
And I am going to be talking today about work done in Dr. Elizabeth Prastel's spatial neuroscience lab at UCI. And the main question that we are focusing on in this study was asking whether exploration behavior can explain navigation performance. So we were thinking about this because we know that there are major individual differences in the way that people navigate, the way that people explore new environments, and spatial navigation is such a vital skill to everyday life that obviously these individual differences are really important. Um, and so we were thinking about this in the context of the way people learn new environments. So someone might be able to be placed in a new environment um, and be really comfortable, really confident with a new route after just a couple minutes in that environment, maybe that's their only exposure, um, and they already can get to where they're going. And other people might have a really hard time doing something like that. They might need a lot more time in that new environment. They might need a couple exposures to that new environment before they can find their way from one place to another, um, or before they would be able to come up with a novel route, one that they have not taken previously. And so we were wondering whether this difference in navigation ability could be due to good navigators exploring that environment initially in a different way than poor navigators. And maybe that contributes to better learning of that maze or um, better retention of the knowledge that they have about the environment. And so we decided to query this using a desktop virtual reality maze. And you can see an overhead view of the maze here on the right. So each different intersection is represented with a letter and um, each of our nine objects are represented with one of these red circles. And then we have purple lines on the edges that represent um, the landmarks in the maze. So those are uh, famous paintings that are hanging in the walls of our hedge maze. Um, and so this is part of an fMRI task. So when participants are completing this task, they are pressing buttons to either go forward or to turn in space. Um, and so within our exploration section, uh, we had 16 total minutes for exploration split into two eight minute sessions. And during the exploration phase, people were asked to find the nine objects throughout the maze, um, but were allowed to explore freely. And following this exploration phase, we had 48 test trials where participants were told to navigate starting at one object, to another object and um, while all objects were concealed so they were not receiving feedback about where they were in the maze from those objects um, and there was a 45 second time limit and um, I also want to note really quickly that we do have questionnaire data from each of these participants like uh, video game use or sense of direction that kind of stuff um, and Alina another member of the spatial neuroscience lab will be talking about all that work on Wednesday um, but I'm not going to be touching on that today. So this is a view from inside the maze from the perspective of one of our participants. And um, so to start, we're gonna to be told which object we're starting at and then our target object. And you can see the object is concealed. You cannot tell what object that is. And now at each intersection, we have errors represented which let the participant know where their option is to either turn or move forward. And now we're going to see the landmarks hanging on the walls of the maze. So that's one. We're going to turn and face another one. We're in the center of the maze right now. We're going to turn and face our third landmark. And the fourth one is behind us directly. And so now we have reached an object. We don't know what that object is. And after the participant makes a selection, we do not receive feedback about whether that selection was correct or incorrect. And um, so that is what our, uh, what our task looks like from the participant's perspective. And when we look at the way people perform in this, we have major individual differences. So you can see in our histogram, there is kind of a bimodal distribution where there are some people who perform really, really well are almost or at 100% accuracy. And then we have another group of people who are closer to 25% accuracy on that task. Um, and when we plot participants according to rank order, you can see the same thing where we have a bit of a sparser distribution 
um, in the middle performances and then more groups um, around 25% and uh, really, really accurate participants. So when we, were, when we were asking our question of whether exploration behavior can predict navigation performance, we split this up into a couple of different sub-questions. The first of which being, what are the common errors in our test fees and are some routes easier than others? We also wanted to know whether anyone improved over the course of the test phase. Is there learning happening, not just during exploration, but also during the test trials themselves? And after we asked these questions about the test fees, we wanted to move into asking about um, exploration data as well, because that is what we were most interested in here. So the first question was, how do some of our exploration metrics, specifically object visits, path length, and evenness of exploration, how do all of those metrics relate to accuracy? We also asked whether participants took the same exact path in the test fees that they had previously taken in the exploration session. Um, and whether that strategy would change over time, whether participants were more likely to take that exact route earlier in the test phase or later in the test phase. Um, we also used graph theory metrics, in this case, uh, between the centrality and tested whether between the centrality matched up with participants' exploration patterns or a modeled random walk through the maze. And then finally, we wanted to look at all the variables we had describing the exploration phase together and see if that would allow us to predict navigation performance. So in that section, we'll be using principal component analysis or PCA and uh, uniform manifold approximation and projection or UMAP um, to group all of our the variables that we have describing the exploration phase together um, and use that to see how different categories of navigators um, how they differ in exploration strategy. So starting out describing our test phase, we're gonna be talking about most common errors and whether some routes are easier than others. And when we plot all 72 of our routes and um, the number of errors per appearance, so this is normalized by the number of times that each route appeared in the maze, um, and we have this plot organized by start object. So these are all grouped with the same starting object and then going to different locations. You can see that within certain start objects, depending on where you're going, there is a different level of difficulty even within that same start object. Um, and across different starting objects, obviously there is variation in the difficulty of the route with some routes having errors of almost 80% and some being as low as 20%. So different routes are different difficulty. And we can also order the same data now by target object. So now these are uh, representing going every, every chunk is uh, representing going to a certain target object. Um, and you can see even when we are going to a certain location, you know, in some cases it's easier. N, for example, is kind of tucked away in a corner and it's a little bit more distinctive. So maybe by the time you get to that corner, if you're there, you're gonna be like, oh, I know where I am. And maybe that is gonna contribute to um, fewer errors at location N where objects P and Y, for example, it's really easy to switch them up for one you go left, for the other you go right at the same intersection. So that might be a little bit harder to get to those target objects. Um, but within each of these, depending on your start location still, there is a difference in difficulty. So we thought that was really interesting and something that we kind of happened across was what we call route asymmetry. So some routes are harder in one direction than the other, which we were not expecting, obviously. One route in one direction versus the reverse direction is gonna be the same length. We pass through the same number of nodes, same number of turns, we pass the same landmarks on the way. Um, but we did find there was a difference in the number of errors between a route traveled in one way versus its opposite direction. Um, and so the magnitude of these bars here are representing the um, number of errors different between a route uh, forwards and backwards. So for some, this difference is zero or really close to zero. Those are more symmetrical routes. And for others, there is a major difference between um, a route traveled in one direction versus the other in terms of how many mistakes people were making. So the next question that we asked about the test fees was whether anyone improved, whether learning happened during the test fees. And um, what we see when we look at that, we can compare either the first half to the final half or the first 10 trials to the final 10 trials. 
And in both cases, we see the same thing. Participants do improve on average from uh, the, uh, the first part of the test phase to the final part of the test phase. Um, and I have all of our participants plotted here. So you can see there is there are still people in the last half who are performing pretty poorly. There are a lot of people who are performing really well, but there are still people who are performing really well in the, the first half of the test phase. And um, we thought this was interesting. And, uh, potentially provides evidence that yes, people are learning during the test phase, even though all of the objects are concealed. And um, so maybe that is because you're told where you're starting. If you're told you're starting at the spaceship, now that's giving you an indication of like, oh, that's where the spaceship is. And maybe that's going to jog your memory for, um, for later trials. And so next we went into explaining um, or examining the exploration phase in more depth. So the first thing that we wanted to do was ask whether metrics from the exploration phase correlated with accuracy in the test phase. And the first set of metrics that we were working with was distance traveled. And we split this up in two different ways. At the top, we have distance traveled in virtual units. And at the bottoms, we have um, nodes and turns traveled in exploration. Um, and so in both of these cases, distance traveled does not predict accuracy. So it is not the case that participants who go further, who you know, go through more nodes or repeat the same nodes multiple times, those are not, uh, that's not related to accuracy. Those people are not necessarily um, going to be better navigators. They're going to remember that better because they went further in the exploration phase. And the next thing we asked about was evenness of exploration. So here we use evenness of exploration as um, the standard deviation of number of object visits. So a really low standard deviation means that you distributed your object visits really evenly. You went to every object as often or almost as often as every other object. And then a really high standard deviation means that you went to some objects a ton and some objects not very much at all. Maybe you didn't even visit that object. And um, so that is what we mean when we talk about evenness of exploration. And when we look at how people distribute their object visits over the course of the entire session, over our whole 16 minute exploration period, we do not see a relationship between accuracy and that evenness. But we wanted to look at exploration on a finer time scale to see if people are changing their exploration strategies over time. And what we see when we break up exploration into four minute quarters is that evenness in the second and third quarters of the exploration session, so the middle half of our session, um, we do see a relationship between evenness and accuracy, where people who are the most even have the lowest standard deviation of object visits are also the most accurate. So this could be an indication that yes, strategy is changing over time, where our best navigators during that middle half are distributing their visits really evenly, and maybe that is helping them piece together the different, um, different quadrants of the maze. Maybe that's helping them um, figure out that one hallway connects uh, to some other intersection that they hadn't previously realized, um, and that is going to help them better integrate their, um, their cognitive map so that they understand the representation where, um, where how, how all of these different locations are fitting together. Um, and so the next thing that we asked was whether participants repeated a route in the exploration, um, in the test phase that they had previously taken exactly in the exploration session. And we call this sequence trial matching. So this means that if in the exploration phase, you take this blue squiggly route to get from this object to this object. And obviously in the exploration phase, you're also gonna be going all around, but you do at one point travel this route. Let's say in the test phase, you are tasked with going from this object with the blue star to this object with the red star. If you take that exact same route that you took previously in the exploration session, that is a sequence trial match. The alternative is like, let's say we have this new blue squiggly route to get from point A to point B. If in the test session, you are tasked with still going from point A to point B, but now you take a different route, that is not a sequence trial match. And we were considering this maybe a measure of flexibility where people who are using a sequence trial match are using something that they know for a fact is gonna work. They are relying on just their memory of an exact path that they have taken before where people who are not sequence trial matching are finding something new out about the maze, whether it's a novel shortcut or just taking a new route to uh, get them 
from uh, their start object to their target object, they are doing something different than what they've done before. And we thought of that as a measure of flexibility. So we wanted to know whether this strategy would change over time, whether people would be potentially more flexible at different parts of the session. And we found, yes, people are, <clears throat> excuse me, people are more likely to use a sequence trial match early in the test phase than they are at the end of the test phase. Um, so this is just the trial number. This is not a specific route here on the x-axis. So um, people, we have not looked at whether people are more or less likely to sequence trial match on specific routes um, compared to other different routes. Um, and then we have the total number of sequence trial matches for all of our participants on the y-axis. So we do see that this relationship changes um, as we go further into the test phase. So we were then wondering, does, um, does this relationship, does this measure of flexibility have any bearing on a participant's accuracy or improvement? Maybe this is an indicator that people are learning more. And we saw in um, our improvement data that people do get better as the test phase goes on. So maybe that is somehow related to this measure of flexibility. And what we found was that is not the case, that this measure of flexibility is, does not relate to accuracy. And I'm not showing the improvement data, but there is also no relationship between flexibility and improvement. So the next thing that we asked was whether participants, um, whether the way participants navigate in the exploration phase is aligned with uh, graph metrics, spe specifically between the centrality, um, whether participants explore differently than a random walk, and whether that random walk is also in line with uh, um, the graph metrics that we're looking at. And so between the centrality is this uh, graph theory metric that represents the number of shortest paths that pass through each node. So if one location in the maze is really important for getting from one place to a lot of other places, and it's the most efficient way to do that, that point is gonna have higher between the centrality. And that's not a super intuitive explanation, at least for me. So I also think about between the centrality as how important a node is or how much information that node conveys about the structure of the rest of the maze. Um, and when we're thinking about between the centrality, we're thinking about our maze, not as a maze, not like it looks right here, but as a network. So in that network, each of our locations, each of these letters, which represents an intersection is going to be represented as a node. And each of the hallways that connect intersections are going to be represented as an edge. So our maze comes up looking something like this. And some of our points like R, for example, is going to have really high between the centrality. There are a lot of shortest paths that pass through R. And it's really important for the structure of the network. And you can compare that to another node like P, for example, which is a dead end. So that is going to have a between the centrality of zero because there are no shortest paths that pass through that mode. It's unimportant, kind of, to the structure of the maze, even though it's an object. And so we would think it's interesting. Um, but it does not convey information about the rest of the structure of the network. So we wanted to know how between the centrality would relate to the number of times that a participant visited that location. And what we see is this really strong relationship between between the centrality and number of visits to each location. And all of our objects with a between the centrality of zero are down here. And then we have our really central locations like R or T that are really important to the structure of the maze, really important to get from one side to the other, um, have a really high between the centrality. And this relationship kind of makes sense between the centrality is intrinsic to the maze, to each of these intersections. And it's kind of hard to navigate through the maze without being aligned with between the centrality because it's, it's really hard to get from one side to the other without going through these high between the centrality points. Um, so we wanted to know, are our participants doing something different than a random walk through the maze? Um, and kind of the question there is, are our participants maybe paying more attention to the objects, paying less attention to the high between the centrality points? Um, because those are easy to remember. They're really distinctive and you don't need, you as a person don't need to visit those as many times, um, even though they have high between the centrality, even though they're important to the structure of the maze generally. Um, and what we found was that a model's random walk looks pretty much exactly the same as the way our participants navigate. So this relationship with the, between the centrality is the same. There are no differences here. Um, 
and we see our objects clustered around at zero again, and then our really high between the centrality and um, really important nodes are um, up at the top right. And so no difference between these relationships, um, which was, we, I, I was expecting our participants to navigate differently than a random walk, but it does kind of make sense that everybody navigates according to between the centrality because that is just like a description of the network. You, it's really hard to navigate in a way that is not aligned with between the centrality. Um, so the next thing that we want to do, kind of pulling all the variables that we've talked about together, can we predict accuracy in the test phase by using all those variables that we have together. And doing this, as I mentioned at the very top, we are going to be using UMAP or Uniform Manifold Approximation and Projection and PCA or Control Component Analysis. Um, and for both of these, we are thinking that output will be points that are taken from high dimensional space. In this case, we have 16 different variables or dimensions that are describing our both exploration and test data. Um, and so we'll be representing all those variables in two dimensional space. And the variables that we're talking about here are things like average response time, number of turns, path distance traveled, and trial duration. So some of the variables that we've talked about already, um, but some new ones that we have not touched on as well. And so what we're doing in these plots and both of these types of plots are we're gonna be color coding based on navigation performance. So we split our participants up into thirds based on average accuracy in the task. Um, and we're using that to, to categorize and to color code our points. Um, and then we would hope, we would expect that if there are differences in the way that people navigate, if there are differences in these patterns of strategies that we would see distinct clusters of different colored points. So there'd be one cluster, one color, and then two, three different clusters based on navigation performance. And what we see in the principal component analysis is that we have a bit of a cluster of good navigators pulling out from um, middle of the line and poor navigators. This kind of makes sense. The test phase is what we're using to define good navigators from poor navigators. I do want to emphasize we do not have accuracy data fed in here. If we did, you would probably see really distinct clusters. Um, but for this, maybe our best navigators are making the fastest responses, are having shorter overall trial times, are more likely to make a selection at the end of the trial, those kind of things. And that is contributing to um, them potentially looking a little bit more distinct from the middle and poor navigators in our test phase data. And we can look at the same data, the same response time, overall time, um, path distance travel data when it comes to our exploration phase. And what we see there is really no patterns at all. Everybody is loosely distributed here. So we are not seeing any distinct patterns where good navigators are doing something different than poor navigators who are doing something different from middle of the road navigators. So we wanted to go from this now to using UMAP, um, which is my favorite method for high dimensionality reduction. And when we use UMAP looking at the test phase data, we again see um, our good navigators are starting to pull away from our middle of the road and poor navigators. And maybe there are some distinct clusters now of middle of the road and poor navigators that we were not seeing with the PCA, um, with the PCA plots. So maybe this means that um, these participants are doing something different in the test phase than these participants, even though they are both groups of middle and poor navigators. Um, and so again, we're gonna look at our exploration phase data. And again, we see no distinct groupings based on um, category of navigation performance in the test phase. But what we do see that I think is really interesting is that there are distinct clusters. So these people are doing something different when you look at all of the data that we have describing the exploration phase when compared to these people down here, for example. So it looks like we are seeing different strategies adopted in the exploration phase, but that is not necessarily having any bearing on the performance category. So that's kind of the big takeaway from those plots. That's the interpretation that we had is that participants can have those different navigation strategies. We can see them pull apart in both uh, UMAP and PCA plots, but that does not necessarily relate to their performance. So this is very much a work in progress. So um, we would love input 
first of all, but we still are working on a lot of this analysis. Um, and one of the things that we really want to continue doing is looking at the temporal dynamics of behavior during the exploration phase on a finer time scale. So I mentioned that we split up the um, evenness of exploration data into quarters, four minute quarters, instead of the 16 minute entire exploration phase. We want to continue doing that with the rest of our analysis and maybe even look at uh, evenness of exploration on a finer time scale, maybe within quarters two and three, where we saw that split, uh, significant relationship between evenness and accuracy. Maybe if we broke that up a little bit um, onto a finer time scale, we would see even greater differences. We would be able to parse apart um, our different participants' navigational abilities even better. The second thing that we want to do is we have fMRI data from this. So we want to be using that fMRI data. We want to be using um, potential brain activity differences to see if we can, we can then better examine good navigators' exploration and learning during the exploration phase from poor navigators. And maybe that is going to, uh, maybe that's going to be the thing that cracks the code and lets us tell good navigators apart from the poor navigators. Um, and then finally, we have been talking all about accuracy here, but accuracy is not the be all end all of performance in this phase. So we can also be asking about path efficiency in the test phase. Maybe we have some participants who are really accurate, but they're not taking the most ideal route to get from point A to point B. So we want to know if there is if there are a group of navigators who are really efficient, they're taking the most ideal route every time, and, and maybe those are maybe those people are less accurate, maybe they don't remember everything, but when they do, they do a really good job getting from point A to point B. And so we are trying to incorporate path efficiency in addition to accuracy as a measure of navigation performance in the test phase. And so to um, look back to the outline we had at the beginning, how many of these um, sub-questions did we answer? Starting out with common errors, whether some routes are easier than others, the answer to that was yes. Some routes are even easier in one direction than others, which I still don't know really what to make of. Um, the second question we asked was whether anyone approved over the course of the test phase. And the answer again, yes, no matter how you split it up, whether you're looking from the first half to the second half or the initial 10 trials to the final 10 trials, people do improve over the course of the test phase. We next asked about how object visits, uh, exploration path length, and evenness of exploration related to accuracy. This I mentioned just a second ago that we are trying to split up onto a finer temporal scale. So that is something that we are going to be doing moving forward. We looked at um, sequence trial matching, whether participants take the same paths in the test that they did in the exploration phase. With this, there's still some work to be done to come up with better categories. It isn't necessarily that a participant either sequence trial matched or they didn't, and those are the only two types of test trials. You also could have a wander. Maybe somebody got where they were going, but they went a really goofy route, and that isn't necessarily flexible. You know, Maybe they just happened to end up at the right object, and that's something different than a non-sequence trial match, which we think of as a measure of flexibility. Um, and kind of along those same lines, we have been saying that sequence trial matching is less flexible, but maybe people sequence trial match with the most ideal routes. Maybe they found the best route in the exploration phase. And to say that that's inflexible in the test phase is um, maybe not necessarily accurate. So that is something that we are looking to do with our sequence trial matching going forward. And um, we also asked whether graph theory metrics match up with exploration patterns. The answer to that was yes, when we looked at between the centrality, whether you look at our participant data or a model of a random walk through the maze. And then finally, we asked whether all variables um, taken together in both PCA and UMAP plots could explain navigation performance or predict navigation performance. Um, and this is a place that we also want to be integrating both accuracy and path efficiency. Um, to see maybe uh, maybe those different clusters of explorers um, in our UMAP plots, maybe those are people who are differently um, efficient when navigating. So that is something that we want to be looking into further with that. And just to wrap up, we'll give a quick summary. Um, our initial question was whether we could find strategies that people took during the exploration phase that contributed to better learning or better retention of that learning of the maze. We asked this question using object visits, path length, evenness of exploration, improvement, and sequence trial matching. And what we found was that behavior during the exploration phase was 
not adequate to explain navigation performance during the subsequent test. We did see that significant relationship between evenness of exploration in quarters two and three of exploration and accuracy, um, but we were not satisfied that that was, that was everything. So we are going to be still looking for this relationship. Um, and finally, I wanna thank everybody in Dr. Castle's lab who helped with this project and also our funding, which we received from the Institute for Collaborative Biotechnologies and California Nanosystems Institute, because this project would not have been possible with, without any of these people. Um, and with that, thank you for your attention. And I would be happy to take any questions if anyone has one. Thanks a lot. It's a great talk and really interesting to hear this talk after Eva's and uh, compare the results. And um, yeah, anyone who has any question, at least raise your hand. Okay, so for now, I will ask a question uh, regarding the comparison between the talks um, for both of you, actually. Uh, it seems that the results somewhat differ in terms of the weather exploration has a, an effect on uh, behavior. Do you think this could be a feature of the environment uh, or a feature of the me measures you were using? Uh, it seems that if I, you were using more measures of pointing and map drawing, which might be more related to sense of direction and Kate, you used object finding, which could yeah, be I, I think using that's, the graph. I, I think that's a really good point. And that, that could also be a function of the different types of, of environments that we were looking at, um, in addition to, to the different metrics that we were using um, and kind of the different questions that we were asking. But yeah, I think, I think that's a really good point. Um, it would kind of make sense if these things aligned a little bit better, um, but maybe it is um, an environmental difference because of the, the really major differences between the mazes that we were looking at. Uh, Ruth had a question. Uh, was that for me? Yeah. Oh, great, thanks. Um, one of the things that, by the way, great talk, really, really enjoyed it. Uh, one of the things that struck me that was very different between your environment and Eva's environment was that all the uh, all the junctions and all the turns that your participants uh, make are right angle turns. Mm -hmm. And there's been a lot of work that's shown that we're very sensitive to the uh, change in angle when we uh, make a change in direction. So I wonder whether, I mean, I just think it'd be so interesting if you could take your maze and, you know, stretch it, deform it, so that topologically using the um, your graph representation where each junction was a node and each connection was, um, an edge, if you actually deformed it such that your um, graph representation and your values for, cent for centrality, closeness centrality were identical, but you no longer had right angles. And I think it would be really interesting because I would put myself on the line here and predict you will start to find some differences then. And that's one really key difference I note between Eva's uh, environment and your environment. So ha had you given any thought to the effect that having such a rectilinear environment might have on your data? Yeah, I think I think that's a really good point. Um, definitely the, the way that we have the data set up makes it really easy to see whether like people's direct head facing at the time, which is something that other people in the lab have been looking at is the effect of head direction on these navigation questions that we're asking. Um, but I think that's a great point. If we stretch out the maze, if we change those angles, um, how do the questions that we're asking change and how do those um, exploration patterns or navigation performances change? I think that's definitely something worth pursuing in the future. Yeah, thank you for the question. And we have two comments in the, or several comments in the chat uh, about first uh, from Steve uh, about uh, seeing this data in a 2D metrics format. Uh, and then from David, uh, about uh, the effect of the unidirectionality. Mm. Yep. Yep. So, and we have another question. Yeah. Anything else? Go ahead. Um, yeah, it was very nice. <laughs> Could you venture a guess about what then 
might determine these different performances if it isn't different strategies? What could potentially be other factors that affect the results? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think that's something that we're hoping to have a better answer to once we start looking into the fMRI data. Maybe the best navigators in the test phase have certain patterns of activity at certain phases. Maybe they're, they're learning a lot about the maze in different ways than um, the poor navigators are. And we're not seeing those behavioral differences because maybe they're exploring the same way, but they're thinking about the way that they're exploring differently. Maybe they're paying better attention. Maybe they remember the, the parts of the maze better because they're doing a better job integrating it in some way. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's what I'm really excited for. That's where I think we're gonna find these major differences. Um, but yeah, that's a really good question and definitely something we're still thinking about. You know, there there are these differences between good and poor navigators and where do those come from? So I think the the um, fMRI data is gonna be um, our best bet for finding those differences. Um, but yeah, def definitely something that we're still thinking about. Thank you. Yes, Gundis. We cannot hear you. For some reason, I, I think we cannot hear you. Gunzi cannot hear you. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes, OK. Uh, OK, so this, this microphone wasn't working. All right, uh, sorry, again. Um, uh, I'd be interested in whether there, are, there might be correlations um, between successful navigation in, in, this, in this kind of maze in particular and something like short-term memory capacity or, or something like mental rotation, uh, since it seems like these are things that are very important for remembering uh, the, those kind of terms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. Um, and so Alina is gonna be talking about um, some of the questionnaire data that we have. One of the other members of the Spatial Neuroscience Lab um, is in the Wednesday session. So she is gonna be talking about um, like video game use, sense of direction and um, that kind of stuff and also hippocampal volume data um, in relation to um, this, this whole study. So I hope that, I don't know that information off the top of my head, I don't have any of those questionnaires, um, but I hope that that will be able to, to answer that question better. Cause I think that is a really good point. Um, there's individual differences that we didn't get into here like age and sex. Um, so those, those could all be things that are contributing to these expiration differences and also performances in, in the test phase. So yeah, that's a really good point. All right, so if, if there are no further questions, there are a lot of interesting uh, comments in the chat, which will remain here. Uh, and we will meet in 13 minutes uh, for the flash talks in post -ups. And thank you all for listening. And thanks to all the speakers.